Okay, we're sitting here, looking beautiful. I don't know if we're live yet. We are. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that was picking it up. We were sitting here, it picked up sitting here looking beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that was good. You did well. You did really oh, well. Oh, man. Hi, everybody. It's Game Changers with me, Vicki Abelson. And our guest tonight is my good friend, James Morrison. Hi, James. Hi, Vicki. Thanks for You're having always... me again. Anytime. I will have you anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Likewise. Um, I was telling James that for some reason, when we go live, this weird thing happens and it doubles the sound. So I said, okay, let's just sit here and be quiet while we go live so it doesn't double. And then I heard myself saying, we're sitting here going, <laughs> looking beautiful. But James, 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 I'm, I'm so happy to see you. Thanks, likewise. I've been blessed to have your good company lately. Um, it was so wonderful to see you um, in Ojai. That was, that was nice. Yes, thanks for that. That was so fun. And I'm actually coming back up. Uh, do you know, um, well, I know you know the who, the who. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, Lauren Gold, I, I'm, I'm, I'm multitasking while we're talking because what happens is Facebook doesn't send notifications to people anymore. So I'm now doing that while we're chatting. Normally, I would have you start singing, but I don't want you to sing until people get here. Um, How can you do that? I can't even tune my guitar and talk at the same time. That's so hard. I'm telling you, I, I'm doing a post right now while we're chatting. I should have you chat so that I can do this. But um, okay, go ahead and do that. I'll tell you. Uh, tell I'll us tell you a story about the Who. I mean, I yes, I have. Oh, I met Pete Townsend, and and listen, I, you know, I don't I don't drop names very often, but yeah, it's Pete. It's Pete. So come on. I met him at my friend Des Makinoff's house after oh, I... the, the after opening night of Tommy. Wow. Back in what, 92 or whatever that was, 94. And I had no idea he was gonna be in the room and I walked around the corner and it was just him sitting at the piano. <gasps> no. And, and, my, and my wife Riyadh and I walked in the room and I, Des had this coffee table that was low to the ground. So you had to sit around it when you ate. Yeah. And I just walked over to the coffee table and and, and got down on my on one knee. <laughs> oh my and when we left, my wife said, you know, you genuflected when you walked in the room. <laughs> and I said, I did not. Yeah, yeah, you did actually. And she didn't, I mean, she didn't understand because it was Pete. Um, you know, I- It was I, a natural response. I saw, have you, have you, you did see them. Did you see them live that you saw I, them? No, I, no. no, they were in the theater and I, I've never seen them live. No, they were, they were at Tommy, but I just saw them walk in. But then I got to spend all morning with Pete talking to him. He's a lovely man. No, you really, didn't. Yeah, oh yeah. He was genuinely uh, uh, engaged. And, and I mean, it was like when you meet people, you, you idolize, you know, you have to be careful because sometimes they, they have feet of clay. Yes. <laughs> well, no, he's a uh, he's a uh, he's a dear man. He was very present and caring, and and he's so smart. I mean, forget it. You know, I'd never seen them, and right before the pandemic, a couple of months before the pandemic, I went to the Hollywood Bowl, and Lauren Gold, who's been playing keyboards with Roger Daltrey and with the Who for about ten years now. Mm -hmm. uh, had played my living room a couple times. He's he's delightful. You're going to get to meet him in Ojai. I'm going to arrange that. Oh, great! We're coming well, up. Next, we're coming up next week. We had fun with Anson. We should. Well, we'll get, Anson will be with us again. And uh, I introduced Anson to Lauren, and they became fast friends. And so, anyway, I took Pete, who used to work my camera, to the Hollywood Bowl, and we had unbelievable seats. And we saw the Who. And I just want to say that I was expecting kind of a geriatric kind of sad but gotta gotta do it gotta see got i can't die before i see the who and james it was maybe the greatest concert i have ever been to roger yeah. was an unbelievable voice and pete yeah. pete may be the greatest guitar player i've ever seen yeah. play live yeah he's one of the greatest and i'm a jeff beck fan i saw beck at the ball me too me too. but i gotta tell you pete Wow, he did things that I've never seen a guitarist do before. Yeah, he's you, he's phenomenal. 
And it's so nice to hear that he was lovely in person. Oh yeah, I mean, he was, he, he, I mean, it's so often you meet people that it doesn't matter if they're famous or not, they're just not listening to you. They're thinking yeah. about something, with, they're, they're thinking yeah. about the next thing they're gonna say, you know, yeah. yes. or they're, 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 they're not connected, to, they're somewhere else, you know. Uh, yes. But he was he was right there, and and uh, I just left thinking, okay, um, that was a beautiful experience. I was kind of tearing up, and my wife is ten years younger than I am, so she didn't really understand the that she didn't have the same connection to to him and the who. I mean, you know, I was 10, right. 12 years old when I when I discovered them, and I just went, well, okay, these guys. In fact, I wanted to do to an audience as an actor, when I discovered I wanted to do this, that they, I, I wanted to do the thing they did to me. So I look, I count him as one of the influences in my life that made me sort of go in the direction that I ended up going in. What, how, what a one, that is so wonderful. And, and I will, would like to say, James, that you have done that. You have accomplished your goal because you have done that. You have done that. Oh, You wow. do that. You do that. You, you're a nice thing you're, to say. That's you're a phenomenal performer, both as a, an actor and a singer songwriter. And I've seen you do both. And you're going to treat us to a little of the latter, which I'm so excited about. Um, so I've dusted off a tune, you know, for you. I've, I've dusted off a tune. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great I've beat. Been, <laughs> I've been, um, you know, I have a well. We'll talk about this, but it, I, I wanted to because you wanted said you wanted to talk about the the the. I want to talk about what, or COVID or what, yeah. I want to talk about how you and Riyadh and and Seamus have been handling how you handled. Should we say past? It's not past tense though, James. It's not over. No. No. So how have how did you initiate? Okay, when it when the when the when the pandemic struck, yeah. what were you guys do? What was life like when the pandemic struck for you guys? Well, Seamus was uh, in his third year at UCSB, and okay. um, so we, we immediately just focused on his well-being, you know, because right. we have a, a history of that. And yes. and then when they decided they were going to sh shut down and school from home for the rest of the time, we just brought him home, and 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 he handled it pretty well. I mean, that was our main focus, and then we just. We, we have a pretty solid, um, we're, we're pretty insular anyway. Right. Even before this. Uh -huh. So uh, it didn't really affect us all that much. I mean, we, we just huddled a little closer, that's all. So, so it didn't affect you that much, but well, I, I would think for Seamus it had to... Yeah, you know, I mean, you know our history, you know, his medical history. He was, yeah. we, he, you know, his brain so, tumor and uh, he had a brain tumor when he was 10. Mm -hmm. We lived in the hospital. Well, he, a, a month into the lockdown, this is April, maybe. Right. He walked in one day and I was sitting in my office, you know, working and, and he said, you know, we've, we've done this before. And, and, and uh, he said, we're, so we're going to be okay. I, and he said, I, but I'm concerned about people who've never had to do this. Wow. You know, because we had to, we were locked down in the hospital. Uh, how, how long was that period when that was going on? Well, he was on chemo for two, almost two years, but we were in the hospital for three months. We lived in the hospital. And wow. we had, you know, people could come and visit us, except for about a week. There was a, a something of a, uh, I forget what it was, the swine flu thing that went, right. you know, for a week, they wouldn't let any visitors come and see us. This was back in 2009. Right. Um, so, but it wasn't anything like this, of course, but, you know, he, he put that together before I did even. Um, he said, we, we've done this, we, we're gonna be okay, but now this is for everybody to, to experience at the same time. And, and he was right. I mean, he's pretty insightful that way, so. So for him, so he grad he graduated. In, he graduated just graduated, uh, you know, three weeks ago. Whenever I remember when that was yeah. a thing, but he he got to have some sort of graduation, didn't he? Yeah, they 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 had a graduation walk, and uh, we went up there, and they at the last minute decided that the parents could come, which was nice, and they took us through in groups. But we were the very first in line for our group. So he was the very first one to walk up and nobody, there was nobody ahead of him to, so he could see what was happening. 
and he just walked out on stage nobody there to meet him no oh. chancellor oh. so he just walked out there in his you know gown and it, and it was it was quite a sight and we were standing there you know weeping so wait and, a minute they wa he walks out and nobody's there to greet him so what happens when he hits the well they announced they announced his name and they announced his degrees he got two degrees from two different colleges um wow. writing and lit and spanish wow they announced his name and and pronounced it correctly which was nice <laughs> which i don't yeah. always do well because it's spelled seamus oh, so I, yeah sure I, I i always say seamus and then it's shame lots of people do yeah yeah yes. lots of people do um I didn't say that because of you. No, but I, but yeah. I do. I've, I've yeah, yeah. pronounced his name like more than twice. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a natural thing to do. Yeah. Um, Ganga White, a friend Ganga White uh, up at White Lotus Foundation calls him Sea Muse because of his connection to the sea and lovely. Yeah, and he's and in his poetry, you know. So uh, he walked out there and and. Uh, I think he was like, you know, for a moment, he was like a deer in the headlights. He had his phone in his hand and and, and he just went, well, now what, you know, and then they took <laughs> yeah. his picture and, okay, thank you. And he walked off and he got off and he went, what, what just happened? And I said, you know, I've had, I've had experiences like that on stage too. <laughs> what, what just happened? I have no idea. Did I, did it work? Was I, did I suck? Was, you know, so I said, you know, you probably have a few more in your life. Yeah, he probably will. But and it was a beautiful thing. <clears throat> it's it's an amazing accomplishment. And especially yeah. having done the last year. So was it, cha I, I thank goodness you have an older child so that you didn't yeah. have to homeschool and do all of that, that a lot of people had to do, which I can't imagine how difficult that yeah, was. Yeah, that, that, that was, that was a, that's, uh, that's a hard duty. So did you homeschool when mm -hmm. he when he was younger and he had his health issue no he he was in f just finishing up fourth grade in fact the step up they call it um what does that grade. mean step oh. up to fifth grade uh, like okay. a graduation you know right uh at the school they called it the step up he, he that happened while he was in intensive care so the week after he had his surgery um and they tried to pipe him in but the technology didn't work, so you know. Oh wow! He he couldn't even watch it from uh, uh, from his hospital bed. But so he missed fifth grade pretty much entirely. But they weren't worried about it because he 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 read at a almost a high school level. That's what they're worried about then. Right. If you can if you can read it, you know. So he basically missed fifth grade and just went right to sixth when he came back. Wow. Yeah. Aren't, are, aren't there skills that you learn in fifth? I mean, I don't know. Are there not skills that you learn? in? Well, he, you know, he, they, we talked about that and, and decided that he was busy learning other skills, you know, surviving cancer. So, wow, that's he, he got extra credit. <laughs> as, I mean, as, as did you. And, and yeah, yeah I, we got a, our master's degree in something. Did I assume, I don't want to assume, are you a man of faith? I believe I know the answer to this, but. Um... Well, you know, it's, it's, that's an interesting segue because I sort of, I was uh, until that happened. And, um, and now I'm, uh, uh, you know, agnostic at best. So um, that's what happened to me. <laughs> Um, don't I'm discuss curious. it. Yeah, I'm curious uh, about. No, finish your sentence. Well, I don't discuss it in the play that I wrote about what happened to me. Um, uh, my, my play, uh, "Leave Your Fears Here," that we developed a couple of years ago, and which right you did before. in Ojai at the. At... I, I did it in Ojai, and uh, you also did a, a portion of it here in my living room at I Women did, Who Write. I did read some of it there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't discuss it. I just say. You know, so I, I make mention of uh, a, a God that I used to believe in. And I just sort of that's that's the extent of it, because uh, that's not what it's about. It's not about my, you know, my spiritual program, but um, it's about something else. So uh, but yeah, I mean, I had uh, I had a sort of a, an awakening during that time, you know. And 
it sounds like it was the opposite of a spiritual awakening. I don't know what what was the awakening. Can you? Well, well, the awakening was, uh, and I don't talk about this much, so I haven't really. Mm it's, it doesn't really hold a position in my head that, that is readily uh, uh, accessible. Mm-hmm. So forgive me if I if it sounds like I'm uh, I'm not hemming and hawing because I don't want to answer it. I'm no. I, I just don't give it much thought really because I but I decided that uh, that any god that would give a ch- child a brain tumor um, and then decide which child survives it is not really a god that i want to have anything to do with so um i decided that while there's probably a certainly a power greater than me Mm -hmm. that i didn't suddenly replace this power that i reject or stopped believing in or Mm -hmm. however you want to you know whatever your terminology And, and that's up to everybody you know to decide for themselves for me i just decided that there's a that I'm not in, I'm still not, I still, I don't have any more control than I had before. And I'm still as powerless, you know, over uh, everything, but the things that I think, but I just don't spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, uh, about that anymore. So if there's an occasion, James, where in the past you might've prayed. Yeah. What would be uh, your, I, I still call it, I still call it prayer. Okay. I mean, I still, I still pray. Uh, I mean, because I, because it's, it's to me, it's like, uh, you know, you, you, you can call it love, but it's not the same to two different people. It's, you can't describe it. It's just something that you experience or you don't. And mm-hmm. everybody experiences it in a different way. These mm-hmm. labels that we put on things like, you know, just my saying mountain doesn't make, doesn't give you the idea of the beauty of a mountain or the majesty of a mountain any more than my saying prayer gives you an idea of what it is I experience or and how it's different than, than what you experience. Right, right. So these are just all words that we use to describe these things that we, but, but you can call it meditation or prayer or communion or, or uh, surrender. Um, um, I, I, I prefer to just call it gratitude. Mm-hmm. And then I don't have to get a resentment um, because there's no resentment in, in a state of gratitude. This has been my work lately, James. I, I've been talking about it on the air and in life a lot and in the rooms because I discovered I had these resentments I was carrying around for a long time. And mm-hmm. did you read the book, Drop the Rock? Have you oh, read that book? It's, it's no, a, but I've heard about it. No, I've heard about yeah. it. Yeah. So it's a six step book and okay. uh, it, it basically is about dropping the rock, dropping the resentment, letting go. Sure. Yeah. And so I physically took a rock and dropped it. And there was something about the action of doing that, that I actually let go of resentment that I was holding for a couple of years. It oh, was sure. amazing. Yeah. So, uh, but then I can pick it back up because that rock's sitting right here. Mm-hmm. And so somebody just told me about that, that her sponsor had her write on a rock, the names of the, all the things she resented and feared and had them throw those rocks in the lake. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I thought that's what I have to do because then I can't take it back. But I love what you said about being in a state of grace. I cannot, I cannot be in resentment if I am being grateful. It's yeah, impossible. It's impossible. You know that we know what that reminded me of. Uh, when I was uh, 1992, uh, so I was four years sober. No, no, ten years sober. I, 82 is when I got clean and sober. Um. I don't know why I thought 88, because I met Riyadh in, in 88. That's what I was thinking. Okay, so 82. So you're 39? I'm, I'll be 40 in October, yeah. Holy. That's... I know. It's we'll amazing. talk about that and how that happened. So, so I, I had a knee surgery, my, my first one, mm-hmm. and uh, tore the ACL. So they just went in and cleaned it up and took it out. And I, and I didn't get a reconstruction. So, But I, but I, was, I went right to work at, at doing something at PBS... Uh, down on sunset, I was doing a, an Ibsen play. So I, and I was on crutches between, uh-huh. between shots. So I, I had to pretend like I had, didn't have a limp when we were working and then I'd go back and it, it was a raked stage. So, oh. and I, I kept, uh, if I was walking one direction, my knee would give out. 
a sideways. Ouch. Because I had no ACL. And so needless to say, I was given pain pills to use when I needed them. And right. I, you know, I was with my sponsor on this and I went through this thing. And, and Wait, how long were you sober at this point? 10 years. Okay. So, so you know, uh, he just said, you know, don't, it's real simple. You can't heal with, if you can't sleep. The doctor gave them to you. This is part of your recovery. Um, just don't take them if you don't need them for pain. Okay, that's pretty simple. Right. So I came home from work one day and I was in pain and I went, yeah, hmm, yeah, it's pain. Hmm, yeah, okay. So I took a half of one. Then I called him up and I said, you know, I, I, I took him out to the, I, I, I had a question about that because I went, see, I, I could have lived without it, but it's getting on here now. So I, so anyway, so I took him to the, I lived in an apartment building in Hollywood. I took him to the apartment building next door into their dumpster and I threw them in their dumpster because if I knew that I put them in my dumpster, in my building's dumpster, I would dive. Of course. There is not an act, addict alive that wouldn't. <laughs> so, but he said, there was a pause and he said, so why didn't you flush him down the toilet? And I said, well, because <laughs> then they'd be gone. I mean, come <laughs> on, man. <laughs> speaking, can, of the way, I, speaking of the way that addicts' minds work. And he said, because, <laughs> you know, if you really want them, you'll, you'll dive into somebody else's dumpster for them. And you know you will, man. You've done worse than that. And I had. So uh, that was an interesting <laughs> lesson. You know, because you got to, you know, it's just part of you've got to be willing to go to any lines, right? But you didn't do the dive. I did not do the dive. Well, because, you know, they, these sponsors, they're so smart. <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> My favorite. Did you ever see Rescue Me? The Dennis Leary. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Fireman. yeah. That's so serious, my yeah. They were all struggling with sobriety and going in and out and all of that stuff. Right. And they showed the program and everything. But my favorite scene in that was Dennis Leary calls his sponsor and he's having a crisis and he's standing out in front of a bar and he doesn't want to go in and drink. And the sponsor talks him off the ledge and they each hang up their phones and the camera goes to the sponsor and the sponsor is standing outside of a bar lovingly. Oh, looking yeah. in. Wow. And it's like, that's kind of what it is, right? We Do we ever not... Are we well, ever not and, and also when when you're listen when your sponsor says thanks for keeping me sober that's what they mean yeah exactly exactly um, i'm ba i'm back in touch now with my very first sponsor that that got me sober uh well he was my second sponsor but it, you know he's the one i did my fourth step with and fifth step and i mean all the steps with you know really but um he's in nebraska now and we're we're reconnected after all these years never really didn't you know you right. never really lose touch with, with somebody who saves your life, even if you don't speak to them again for 10, 15, 20 years. So true. So you how, know. James, what brought you to your knees? What, what made you get sober? Oh, well, a couple of things. Um, I had about 15 good years. You know, I started really young, started at 13, and, and so I got sober, sober at, uh, at 28. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that's unbelievable in a, that you would have. Yeah. Well, I was in a play. And the, the, with, with the one, two, two of the people that was living with one of them, an actress that gave, you know, was, said, you can't live in your car, come and stay at my house. So <laughs> I did. And she finally asked one night, asked me to leave. <laughs> it was just too insane for her. I was sober, but I'm barely. And she, but she's the one who actually said, you know, you're abusing your gift. And nobody had ever put it like that, but but that was the same week that my friend in the play, who's, who was sober, who was my first sponsor, I came uh, to, to to the theater one night and I was hungover, and I and I never drank before a show, but I was I'm still hungover from the night before. So right, what's the difference? And he said, you know, uh, I said, man, I I I don't. Uh, I, 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 I think I can live like this. I can't live like this. 
And I knew that, you know, he was sober. My, my parents were sober. I mean, I, I went to meetings with my mom when, before she died. She, she was 17 years sober. I, was, I grew up with this, the program and I, and sobriety, but I, I you know, and, but they can't, you know, 12 step you, your, your, your parents, right. especially. So I said, I can't live like this to this friend. And he said, you know, uh, you know, it's going to kill you. Right. I said, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I do. I know that. He said, and just your luck, it's going to take you 50 years to die. Whoa. James, what kind of addict alcoholic were you? How, what did your addiction look like? Well, for, for a long time, I was just a, a drinker and, you know, pot smoker. And then I went through a period of uh, harder drugs uh, about, a, about a year. Bless you. And, uh, and bless you again. Thank you. And um, see, this is my agnostic version of, of the sneeze ritual. It still so. bless you. Yeah, I get, thank you. It would have been um, weird if you wouldn't have said anything. I know. Could, yeah, could you please stop that? Because I'm, <laughs> you make me think about God and everything. Come on. Um, yeah, I know for a while it was just whatever you had, you know, whatever you had, Yeah, you know, the standard sort of thing. And how were you, were you did you get blasted? Were you, were you a blackout drinker? Was it from the first, from the first drink when oh. I was 13? Yeah. I mean, but, but, you know, for many years I was functioning because I, I, I worked and I, uh, where in your career were you James, when you when you got eskimo when uh, we're going to talk about Alaska too, but. Uh, um, when, when, uh, things. Well, I was, I just come to LA. I was, I'd been here a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, uh, I hadn't, I didn't have my SAG card yet. So I wasn't working in TV and film yet, but I had my equity card. I've been working on stage for years since 78. So, or, I mean, I started when I was in high school, but. I didn't get my union card till 78. So, you know, I mean, I was, uh, but I was functioning, you know, I kept other jobs. I had other, I, I had civilian jobs. and Like what kind of day jobs did you work? Oh, oh, I did everything. I, I you know, I, I was a waiter. I was a furniture stripper. That's, I mean, I, my, one of my first jobs, I say, you know, I was a stripper when I first came to, <laughs> to LA. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. You know, pine furniture. <laughs> as uh, I recall, you had a role as a stripper as well. That was my first TV job. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I got my SAG card with that job the day my mother died. Oh, my God. Uh, so, uh, you know, but I was functioning. I mean, I was a truck driver. I was a teamster for a while. I did. Every, I've done everything. Wow. I've done a lot of stuff. I've had a lot of jobs. Wow. Uh, but so I was fun. I, I knew how to function and I could, you know. Um, did you ever lose a job because you No, I was just going to say I, I never. Uh, one time I was teaching, I was teaching mime in mm -hmm. Alaska for the, the Alaska State Council on the Arts. And I was probably 24 years old. Mm -hmm. And I stayed up all night drinking in a bar in Ketchikan. And I went into the, uh, to the next day. And I, of course, I just smelled like a brewery. Didn't matter. You can't wash that off. <laughs> Yeah. And, and uh, one of the little girls in the class uh, who was one of the best mimes said, oh, you smell like beer. And everybody in the class. And I was so mortified. I remember that. And I said, man, this is not this is not normal. This is not a normal. And I knew I knew for years that I was, you know, excessive. But but, you know, the thing the thing that I, I really like to discuss about this. Yeah. Is. Is, is for a minute just that the things that cause us to to need to uh, to need to to, to to alter our, our our state of consciousness or our reality? Please do, because I think a lot of people are struggling right now after a year and a half of COVID and losing many parts of yeah. their lives and their reality. So what, so let's talk about that. So, well, I mean, I can't, I, I can only speak for myself, but I, sure. but I, I, I do relate to the, to the, to the isolation certainly. And, 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 and that's the exact subject that we're on is mm -hmm. we've had a lot of uh, sort of forced isolation. And, and, and that's another thing too, I realized, and you probably felt this too. Um, I, I'm a, I'm an expert. 
isolator. I mean, I can, I can, I can isolate in a room full of people or it doesn't, I, I can do it anywhere. I can do it at the drop of a hat. I know how to do it. Uh, it's become my, my go-to pr protect, protective, you know, uh, it, it, even beyond rejecting something before it can reject me, which is a common trait. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the cutting of the nose off. James, did the this face. start for you as a as when you were young because your parents were alcoholics? So, was yeah, that? I think I think it did. It became out of a, an abandonment thing. Probably they were separated, and and uh, when I was really really young, and uh, and and I by no means do I blame them for anything that I went through, but but that was my environment. So we react to our environment the way we react to it. Everybody reacts differently to different, you know, uh, abuses. And, I, and they are, they are, you know, whether people realize that they do it intentionally or not, there, there, there are abusive behaviors and, uh, uh, that are common in, in, in uh, that come with the disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we navigate them as best we can. And then later on uh, in our own, uh, you know, sobriety and, and uh, self-discovery, and, and by sobriety too, I, I don't just mean lack of, uh, uh, substance. Of, a, a, of substance. I mean, I mean, sort of a, a moderate living, a, you know, a moderate, you know, moderation of living. You see what I mean? So you mean I, I, I can't eat too much? I can't, I can't be on Facebook well, too much? I mean, it's because I'm sober, but I still do those things. But yeah. Well, but but just also just observing our behavior. It's just it's, it's a state of observation too. I mean, because we didn't do that when we were out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't we didn't have any kind of a, awareness at all, or we wouldn't have done the, the things. When I look back now, I just go, "How did I? I, I should be dead. Yeah. How did I survive that? I must have, you know. Uh, I don't know." And this is, you know, sometimes where I'm torn too, is because uh, because I do believe in in uh, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in miracles. Me too. Um, I just don't ascribe them to a. Uh, and, and again, you know, even in the big book, you know, people talk about. It, it, and I've, I've been to meetings, agnostic meetings, meetings for atheists. They, they spend the whole hour and a half talking about God. <laughs> and, if, and if they, why talk about something you don't believe in? Unless it's, unless it creates a conflict, you know, in you. And, and, and it's an interesting, you know, dilemma. And, and again, we, you know, we're always taught too, when we first come uh, in, uh, we're, we're spiritually thirsty people. You know, we're spiritually Bankrupt. But we're spiritually bankrupt. I, that's what I was just going to. Yes, yeah. we are spiritually bankrupt. But, but, but I so I don't know if I was seeking spirituality. I don't know if I was aware that I was. I was not aware that I was spiritual. I thought I was very spiritual when I came in. I was a hippy dippy, all that kind of stuff. I I thought I had it all together. I learned later how yeah. I was spiritually bankrupt and all that stuff. See, that's what that's the gift of of of. Uh moderation but 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 there's you know the two ways to look at that word mm -hmm. moderation in terms of uh watching how much you do something but there's also moderation in terms of observing i like that and i get that I, i'm hearing what you're saying because moderation is just that you're being a moderator you're moderating yeah rather than you're doing something in moderation because right. yeah. I can still do too much of something, but I am aware. Sure. Yeah. Sure. You're that you're, but you're aware of it. And you know, you go, Hmm, you know what, this is, mm -hmm. I've got to look at this behavior. And, and I also, I've got a toolbox that I can open uh -huh. up and dig through and, and apply this thing to that thing. And, you know, that's one of the you, gifts. Do right? you remember the last thing that you drank? No, but I'm sure. <laughs> oh God! I lived in Venice, mm -hmm. and uh, you would tell us about the last day. Well, the last day was 
actually, uh, I'd been taking chips for about six months. And I, and I, uh, for those of you Finally, who aren't in the rooms, lucky enough, chips are little plastic for, uh, things we get to commemorate times of sobriety. 30, 30 60, 90 days, uh, six months, three months. I don't know. It's, and it's, it's, a, it's a big deal because you get to stand up and... Everybody... But before, but before, I, before I tell you this, mm -hmm. the last day, remind me of that. But um, I will. I, 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 quickly, I just remember... Uh, taking chips and finally I, I called my sponsor and said man I've been I've been I'm a liar I'm a cheater I'm a thief I'm a dirty bastard oh my god I was like <laughs> you know I said what man what well I've been you know I just realized you know I didn't know for some reason how did I know I mean what I sh should have known I wasn't listening or maybe I knew and what man what uh I you know I've been taking like Valium for six months and and, and he said so so change your sobriety today well, but yeah, he said, no, it's not, a, not, it's not a race, man. We're not, it's not competition. Everybody's going to love you the same. You're not a liar. I mean, we're, we're liars. <laughs> you know, we're liars. That's, yeah. you're just learning how to be honest. And this is part of it. This is a, this is a, okay. So I stood up there and that was hard. Stand up there and say, you know what? I'm starting over. I, this is what I did. And, and one guy said to me afterwards, so what did you do? Well, I took a Valium and I took some Valium. He said, is that all? <laughs> but I walked away going, oh my God, is that all? What is that guy saying to me? Is it, is it, you mean like, that's okay? Was he saying, but yet years later I went, oh no, no. He was saying, is that all? Is there more? Another is there more? Right. <laughs> but you see, that's what the mind, that's what our mind does. Right. What was I going to tell you though? Oh, the last day, the last drink. No, you know, the last day. I mean, that was that was the last day. That was the last day. That was the last day. But but I remember a friend of mine. I went to the stag meeting in Hollywood, a Thursday night stag meeting, and it was just a bunch of guys, 50, 40 guys mm -hmm. in this room like this, sitting next to each other, this this close, you know, right up. And these guys were, I mean, the reason I loved them because they were, I just went, these guys are as sick as I am. I love these guys. I love listening to them. They're, they're gonna save my life. Right. But you, but if you were shy, and I was painfully, sh I mean, I, I was so nervous to speak about myself. Uh -huh. I couldn't, I couldn't wait for that guy, because there was nobody called on you, you had to jump in when, when they were finished. And if somebody oh. was louder than you were, or angrier, or they needed to speak more, <laughs> you just had to go, okay, man, okay. Uh -huh. So I, so one time about six months into this meeting, and I hadn't been sharing, I just been just showing up, you know, listening, right? Like, a, like a newcomer should. Right. So one guy pulled me aside and, and uh, he said, uh, Jim, some, several of us here are very angry with you. Well, and I said, what, 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 what did I do? Well, you won't share of yourself. He was from Panama. You won't share of yourself. And so we think that you don't trust us. You don't like us. And we're very, um, we're very sad. We're very angry with you. Well, wow. oh my God, I don't, I mean, I'm not, I, and he said, you, you have to understand that, that when you share of yourself, that's the greatest gift that you can give someone mm -hmm. because you don't know. That says, I trust you enough to let you know who I am. And wow. you don't know, you may say something that may save someone's life. And you, you don't need to even know that, but you might say that. And I said, wow, I mean, I, I, and I started crying. I mean, I was, I was so moved by this. It was, a, it, was a, it was a revelation. So then I would stop and I'd say, listen, I'm, I'm so fucking nervous right now. I can't, but I've got to. And everybody would go, oh my God, he's going to explode. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm intense anyway. And, and, and in fact, a lot of times I, when I first started going out for work here in LA, people, the feedback I would get, oh, oh no, he's too fucking intense. We can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he's intense, but so what? That's not a bad thing. Came he's to not a bad you. Anyway. So, all right. So you've been sober for a long time. Um, let's get back to the COVID thing because yeah. Yeah, the COVID crazies are the people who are tuned in and uh, are sure. watching. And we want to know. So what was going on in your life? Uh, Seamus was in school. He went online to do school. What were you doing? Yeah, well, because he would go into his dorm and and, and in Riyadh, we, we had a lot of uh, work going on in the house. We decided we were going to 
do some remodeling and we had the money to do that right now. So we did a lot of that. Riyadh sort of was the contractor for that. So she did that. Wait, you and had people I, doing that during COVID? People were working? Uh, oh yeah. And, and, uh, and, you know, we were masked up and everybody was masked up and they were, uh, it was a lot of stuff. It was a bathroom. So we just put them in the, the master bath and all that. I mean, it was, yeah, we did extra precautions and, and, uh, but we just said, you know, we're, this is like six months into it. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, we've had a plumber here from the last, anyway, don't get me started. <laughs> um, I just decided that I was going to learn my, my play and I was going to, I stayed in class with the BGB studio. I worked on some Shakespeare pieces. I, I learned the Scottish dialect finally with a coach. You all this on Zoom. Yeah. yeah. Every week we, you know, all my Zoom stuff, I, I was taking piano lessons on Zoom because I never really learned how to play the piano. I wanted to ha maybe help my, it would help my understanding of music theory. You know, I asked a couple of keyboard players about doing that. Were you successful at learning to play piano on Zoom? Uh, well, I've got, we've got a teacher that's been with Seamus since he was five years old. And he teaches from Hawaii now. So he's Zooming everybody. Oh, wow. So, so uh, yeah, you know, he just taught me the circle of fifths and he's been working on me, working with me on that. And um, I picked one of my songs that I wrote that, that I wanted to learn how to play on the piano. Here's my piano, you can see. I am loving this. Cause so, I, uh, I'd love to learn to play. And I, you know, learned to, uh, I worked on a Robert Burns poem, you know, in with the accent. So that was a because my grandpa was Scottish. He's from Glasgow, you know, and I I've never you to give us a taste of it. I'm gonna, I'm fighting asking you to give us a taste. Can you? Oh, oh yeah, I can. Yeah, you want to hear a little bit of it? I do. Hang on. Hey, okay, now everybody gets to see James's abs. Very good. See my abs, really. Well, not not. I sort of gave you. I gave you more of my crotch. Sorry. <laughs> we didn't get um, the crotch. We got the. Crotch. Okay. Yeah. This is. Uh, you know, I'm still working on this, so it's in process. Work in progress. It's a uh, te a moose. It's called to a mouse. Famous Burns, Robert Burns poem. He finds uh, a mouse when he's plowing the field, uh, and and he destroys the mouse's house. Hoose. So he talks to the to the mouse. I mean, I could go on. So, but it's I don't know. It's, it's... What time do we have? Do we, can I do the whole thing? Yeah, do it. Do it. We want to hear it. Okay, it's in, like in a foreign language. Oh, we have someone on here from Glasgow. So you're going to get somebody. Oh, she, well, don't judge me too harshly. <laughs> he won't. Paul, Paul is so happy to, that you're here. He won't judge. Okay. You. Hi, Paul. My, my grandpa was from Glasgow and I, and I couldn't understand a word he said growing up and everything. I mean, I, all I remember saying to him was what, what, <laughs> what? Okay, here we go. Okay. We sleek it cool and timorous beastie. Oh, what panics in thy breasty. Thou need not start away so hasty with bicker and brattle. I would be laid to rain and chase thee with murder and paddle. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle. Yet me, thy poor earth-born companion and fellow mortal. I doubt not whiles, but thou may thieve. What then, poor beastie, thou mun live? A daemon icar and a thrave, the saw request. I'll get a blessing with the lave and never missed. Thy wee bit hoosy too in ruin. It's silly was the winds are strewing, and Nathan knew too big a nuin of foggage green, and bleak December's winds and suin baith snell and keen. Though saw the fields laid bare and washed, and weary winter coming fast, and cosy here beneath the blast, though thought to dwell, till crash. The cruel colter past out throw thy cell. That wee bet heap of leaves and stibble has cost thee money a weary nibble. Now those not turned out for thy trouble, but hoose or hold to thole the winter's sleety dribble and cranic cold. 
But Moosey, thou art no thy lane, in proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes o' mice and men gang oft aglay, and lay us not but grief and pain for promised joy. Still, thou art blessed compared with me, the present only toucheth thee. But ach, I backward cast my eye on prospects drear, and forward, though I cannot see, I guess and fear. <gasps> oh my gosh. So that's where um, uh, uh, um, the best laid plans of mice and men. I was just going to say, from. I know that line. Yeah. Wow. John Steinbeck lifted it from Robbie Burns. That's so without credit. Oh, yeah. You can do, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a homage, I think. I get you're getting I mean and look what he look what he wrote <laughs> using it so yeah that's I'm sure true. I'm sure Mr. Burns would approve you know um you're getting all kinds of applause on here and everything and and uh, every you're getting a stand uh, on zoom James. oh nice <laughs> that was amazing and there were were I mean what, are, what are, that's a spectacular accent you have happening there oh thanks I did struggle with figuring out what some words were. I missed. Oh yeah, no. That, in fact, there's a there's a translation right next to the original text because it's it's a foreign language. You know, it's wow. It, it wow. It's People, Gaelic. You know, getting goosebumps and uh, somebody said, <laughs> Tony said, "Do you have a kilt?" <laughs> uh, I, you know, I did. I, I did have a kilt. Um, I went to Edinburgh when. Uh, when I was in um, Emily Mann's still life back in the mid eighties. Uh -huh. And um, in fact, I went after the show one night, I went to the bar, they had a bar right in the theater. It was a, the Traverse theater it used to be an old brothel back in the 1600s. And they made a great wow. theater out of it, three different stages. And, you know, there's a little bar next door and I was chatting with some people after the play and I, and I was drinking a, a, an apple fizzy thing, you know, like a, What's an seven up? Oh, okay. You know, like a okay. carbonated apple drink. Okay. And I was talking to this guy who had also had a drink, and I reached down, grabbed the glass, and I brought it up, and there was a something in it that wasn't there, and I took a swig and uh, and realized as I was swallowing that it was straight up vodka, you know, and I I mean, you know, flame shot out of my ears, and I was like three years sober, I guess. So I immediately got on the phone to my sponsor back in the States. I think I woke him up. It was the middle of the night or something. I said, man, what do I do? And he said, well, did you have another sip? I said, no. I mean, then don't worry about it. I mean, it's, a, you know, it happens. But it was intense. Did you get a buzz? I got a little bit of a buzz. I mean, that's, that was a scary thing. I just thought, okay, I'm waiting for that, you know, that, that warm rush of, you know, mm -hmm. And it explodes behind your eyes. And I mean, you know, we listen, we can, we remember this like it was yesterday because we have to keep it there so we don't repeat it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you got a little freebie. That's a good thing. Uh, oh, I got a little shot. Of, yeah. Well, I love that you're using the time. Okay. So, how did it impact your day to day living, such as did you guys go shopping? Did you go to stores? Did you have to? No, no. We, we ordered out, we ordered in. I mean, we ordered food from, like a lot of people did. I mean, mm -hmm. we tried to, to, uh, to, to um, you know, we live in Ohio, which is, a, 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 of course, you know, but for everyone else, it's a small community and, and no, uh, no chain restaurants or stores really. I mean, it's all, you know, local uh, things. So we tried to help them, um, you know, I, I remember tweeting something about, you know, at some point, you know, try to support your local mm -hmm. businesses. And, and, you know, and man, I got trolled like crazy. And I said, Jesus, all I was trying to do was people are, you know, these service uh, professions are struggling. Oh, so, God. yeah, you, I'm not asking you to take your life into your hands. I'm just asking you to, but, you know, Twitter. I, I, I rarely <laughs> weirdos <laughs> God. so I some beautiful people so, there but yeah there's the upside to to yeah. this media thing 
And you, okay, so let's go here. Let's segue this way. We're, we're going all over the place, but we'll, we'll circle back. So you're very political. You are an activist and a uh, humanist. And what kind of, and you're also an act, you know, a, a celebrity. So I assume that not all of your fans are of the same political thinking as you are. Did you take a lot, did you take shit um, in the last few years? before uh, the trans- oh yeah I've been trolled I've had my life threatened I've, I've had uh, sure I mean there there's some crazy people out there and and for a while there was a I think they call them Twitter aggregate sites or something there was a oh God, I don't where know. they would just you know they would retweet something that I'd and then and then everybody would attack uh, oh. I went through that period where you know you wake up in the morning and you just go oh my god thousands of you know, uh, threats and, you know, but. Um, How do you handle that stuff, James? Do you, do you block people? Do you unfollow oh, oh, yeah. unfollow all that stuff? If it's, if it's somebody that wants to, that, that is, you know, has let me know that they're, every once in a while I'll, I'll engage if, if I know that I can make a point of, uh, in doing so. Um, the problem with that is, I mean, have you ever changed anybody's mind? Can anybody? I, I have, yeah. Um, well, especially in, in, in healthcare. Give me an example of that. That's fact. With, with with healthcare. Okay. The healthcare debate. Okay. Um, and, and some, you know, I think like I remember five or six people just finally going, you know what, I, I didn't think I I I hadn't thought of it that way. Wow. And um, I I I see where you're coming from, and I. And I, and I think if you put it in a way that's um, sometimes you just want to, you know, tell them to fuck off. Right. And that's when you block them. But, but otherwise you can just say, you know, I'm not looking to change your mind, but if, but this is where I'm coming from. If you, if you care and they go, oh, well, but yeah, but what about, and I go, well, then look at this. I mean, I, and I, and I just use facts. I don't use even my opinion. I just go, well, but that's not, you know, that's not really the case. You're being fed a line there. Uh, so, lo- so look at this thing here. These are factual things. And, and, uh, and I use my own personal experience uh, as a, an example too. And I, and I, th- it, that's hard to dispute Yeah. when people do that. With your son's illness, I assume is what you're talking about. Yeah. And in terms of, of uh, pre-existing conditions and mm-hmm. and uh and how we need to address that issue you know mostly the debate around uh obamacare happened right at the time that we were in the hospital when that happened 2010 you know and here i was on this show that was a big big fan favor of right wing you know pro torture oh, really? uh, oh yeah 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 i, guess I that mean that makes sense Dick Cheney was like saying, yeah, we got to do more like shit like Jack Bauer does, you know? Oh, you go, you know, this, this, you know, this is just TV though, right? This isn't (laughs) like, this isn't like something that we should adopt as, as, uh, so anyway, when I first came to Twitter, there were a lot of people who were fans of the show that, and I was outspoken, um, that, that were offended that I was a lefty, you know? And I just said, it doesn't matter, you know? If you watch my if you watch my work in the show, how could you look at that guy and go, oh, he's a, if you're if you're not able to discern the difference between fiction and reality, which it's clear that you can't if you're having this debate in your head, mm-hmm. then how could you look at the character I played and go, oh yeah, no, he's a he's a hardcore right winger because it's clear at least from my standpoint that I'm not. Mm-hmm. I'm either apolitical or you know, and I remember once. Uh, What's her name? Laura uh, Ingram. Yeah. From Fox News. Mm-hmm. Came to the set, and we were smoking a cigar up in the room with a bunch of uh, other right-wing luminaries that were there visiting, and I just came up as a courtesy to the to the to the people who hired me. Right. And I was socializing as, you know, in that, in that respect, as a, as a sort of a goodwill ambassador to the show, you know, and we were smoking a cigar and she said, uh, 
So listen, I know that uh, that uh, you're probably uh, a lefty because you're a yogi, but what is Bill Buchanan? And I said, uh, well, he's a patriot. Well, yeah, but, and I said, no, no, there's no yeah, but he, that's, that's what he is. Doesn't have anything to do with politics. And there's just no, there's, there's, there's no arguing with, I mean, anyway, that was a memorable moment. Well, we're going to talk about the yoga too, but since we have gotten to this place, you yeah. have written one of my, fit and recorded, and or, and play one of my favorite. There's a segue songs. into Selfish Man. <laughs> we are segueing into Selfish Man. I'm a selfish man. Um, so for those of you out there uh, who haven't heard it before, you are out to have a treat. This is absolutely one of my favorite songs of, of the last mm. few years, and uh, especially the way James sings and plays it. So I'm going to uh, give you a, a solo uh, here and you can uh, okay I'm gonna try to sing this with a Scottish accent <laughs> do you, do you want to give I'm us a full introduction what what I mean I think it's pretty clear what motivated you but tell us about it um well the first song I wrote about this particular uh psychotic personality that was embodied in this one particular person was the one that I released on uh, inauguration day in, in January 2017, which was "I Don't Know You," which I'm not going to play now. I, I don't even sing it anymore because it's 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 sort of dated since we don't have to know him. <laughs> but I but I wrote this one because uh, I, I mean I was so inundated by the by this you know narcissistic personality disorder and and, uh, <clears throat> and then I decided that it, it's sort of beyond this this one particular person. But we face this kind of uh, psychosis in, it, you know, many of us do every day at, at home or, and, you know, and maybe we're this guy. So that's where, where I've taken it. So it's called Selfish Man. I'm a selfish man Don't you know I take credit for the morning When I crow I take what I want I don't borrow I drink tears I eat sorrow I'm a selfish man I will prevail I don't like to buy things I like to make the sale I don't like to be told I like to tell the tale If you succeed then I have failed I have cruel intent I cut like a knife I will raise your rent I will steal your wife I so discontent Every day of my life, I'm a selfish man. I'm a selfish man. I'm self-made. I take credit for the plan. Long as it's well laid, I'm underappreciated. I'm underpaid. Give me loyalty or be betrayed. I'm a heartless lover, ungrateful son. I'm a greedy brother, I'm a head and run. I have no honor, I'm a thieving crook. I'm a one and done, baby, I wrote the book. He's a selfish man can tell by how he talks about himself as if he's not there it's all about him nothing else he's a selfish man he's a 
selfish man. I'm a he's a selfish man. I love that song. I put a link up where people, I probably just blew people's brains out <laughs> laughing. Uh, I just love that song. I, I, I hope that Thanks, song gets placed in something. It just needs to be placed. It's just uh, brilliant. Um, yeah, and you have, a, you have an amazing you. voice. What, what came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first? Were you a singer-songwriter? Were you an actor? What, what was first? Uh, probably, you know, as we were discussing when we were talking about Pete, I picked up the guitar like anybody in my my age. Right. Uh, when I was ten years old, tw you know, eleven years old, when the Beatles were on uh, uh, Ed Sullivan. Yeah. And then, and then when the British invasion happened, and then the you know the birds and the, but I was a uh, you know a fan of uh, Peter Paul and Mary and the Beach Boys even before that, and, and uh, the Supremes. Man, I love the you know the Motown sound and and. Uh, I was just a music, you know, it took me, it took me to beautiful places and I needed to escape to. So, so I, I, you know, I played the guitar in high school and I, you know, penned some songs back then. Um, so I think that probably came first. And then, and then um, I just discovered uh, it, it was a normal sort of a logical transition to go to this other make-believe world of, of the theater and, uh, you know, storytelling. So um, let's let's go back to so when you were young, you were in. A, why were you in Alaska? Why Alaska? What was that about? My my dad was uh, uh, when my parents got divorced when I was about four, mm -hmm. and he was a, 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 an office manager, accountant, and he traveled around and worked in different places, and he finally ended up at a, outside of Anchorage working on a construction. Uh, job that built the first uh, sort of major highway to Fairbanks from from Anchorage. Wow! And uh, so they decided to get back together, my parents. And we uh, three boys left out of six were still at home, so we all moved up there, drove up the Alcan Highway to be together as a family, and and so that's how we ended up there when I was nine. And so what what was it like? Because half your year it's dark, and then half your year it's light. Yeah. What What was it like when it was dark all the time? It was oppressive. Um, it was, you know, it was sort of. I thought about that a lot during the lockdown. Actually, it was. It was the same. And I, I, uh, February before we locked down. Mm -hmm. I went back east to do a, an episode of Law and Order and everybody was talking about this thing that was coming. What is this thing? And everybody started to wear masks and no handshaking and no hugging. And then I left and immediately, you know, everything shut down. So I went back again a year later in February. I'd had one shot and they were still, you know, of course, it was still raging in New York. Everything was shut down. Mm -hmm. I, I had to isolate in my in my hotel room and I I remember thinking when I was in New York in February, mm -hmm. this, is, this reminds me of when I was a kid growing up in Alaska um, with 20 hours of darkness, you know? Um, wow. That's what it felt like. And, and the streets were abandoned because it was too cold to go out or, you know, but it's interesting that you bring that up because that was, that was a, I remember thinking about that. And, and then I assume that when it was 20 hours of sunshine, of daylight, that that had to be the antithesis of party time. Or oh, yeah. And it, well, it was, it was all party time anyway. It was, it was, uh, and I remember like uh, the highest per capita alcoholism and spouse abuse. Oh, really? You know? Yeah. Well, because, you know, cabin fever and. and wow. Uh, yeah, I remember that being a thing. So when it was dark, would you still see your friends? I mean, would you still? Oh yeah, you, you, uh, you adjust. I think what doesn't adjust is your body's internal clock. 
mm-hmm. externally. You know, so there's there's always a you're always a little bit at war, uh, uh, at war with yourself, and then if you've got some other kind of uh, pathology going on, <laughs> you know, it just adds layers to the to the sick cake that you're serving. So was it was it harder to sleep? It must. Oh yeah, in the summertime. In the summertime, yeah. Yeah. Oh god, yeah. crazy. Okay, so there you are in Alaska, and you are an artist in Alaska. Are there a lot of artists in Alaska? Are you? Is there a community of artists in Alaska? Are you, oh, there we go. There you go. You're back. Uh, were there? Was there a community of artists in Alaska? Were you part of? Oh yeah, yeah. So what was I that? I think like? we know when I when I met those people in high school. I met uh, the local uh, community college uh, players. You mm-hmm. know theater group the improv group and the and the you know they were just the misfits and the uh the minstrel i mean it was it was just this artistic community in this in this really isolated uh place and then and then i went away back and went, i left that you know that was in my indoctrination into into the uh the world of the theater and, and that kind of storytelling and, and making believe and then i went to new york and i'm you know, I traveled around for a while, but I came back to be an apprentice with the Alaska Rep, which was a huge, uh, at the time, Lort uh, Regional Theater. Mm-hmm. I think they had like a $3 million a year budget at, wow. at one point. Yeah. Wow. Because they had, they were an oil rich state and they just said they'd throw money at the arts and, you know, wow. they had like a 25% audience. Uh, uh, and, and somebody said once, I think the taper has like a 0.6% uh, per audience per, per population. In Alaska, a quarter of the population in Anchorage came to see the, so it was, it was huge. Wow. The, yeah, the return on their investment was really great. And I got a really good training there. I got, I got uh, you know, 24 hours a day, 24 seven through uh, Jimmy Carter's CETA program which was the Comprehensive Employment Training Act okay. and uh, covered all different kinds of things, but, but this, they got a grant from the government to pay us $250 a week to, to be apprentices at this theater company. And, wow. You know, got to work with great, great people that came up and from New York and LA and build sets and straighten nails and sweep floors. I mean, we did everything, you know, assist the lighting designers and, and, uh, I got a I got a really well rounded education, uh, better than I think any other uh, college or university could have given me because they they aren't equipped, you know, to do that. So, right. Yeah. And so, were you like I was in a repertory company in Tucson, and so were you con- always working on the next show and building one while acting in one and doing yeah. all of that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, 18 hours a day, you know, um, speaking of dark, I mean, sometimes we never left the theater. We'd go down in the, they had a, underneath the theater, they had a, a, a hallway that you could use to cross to the other side. And we just throw down a blanket and go to sleep. I mean, it was, it was intense, but wow. beautiful. Okay. Yeah. And so how long did you do that before you moved on? Two, to- two years. And so now how old are you when you leave that? Um, 25. Okay. And, and so I went to, I went to ACT and I, cause I wanted to get a classical trip. And plus I love San Francisco and I, um, uh, auditioned to, to go to their, it's a three-year program, I think. And they didn't accept me. I was devastated. You know, I was, I just thought, man, I can't even get into acting school. What, what kind of future am I going to have as an actor? You know? So years later, 12 years later, I'm working with Jay, uh, Bill Ball, mm-hmm. founder of ACT. Mm-hmm. As, as an actor, we're working in, in, in a project together. He's a, where, and he was a one, wonderful actor, actually. Where, where were you working in a project together? We were in Boston doing a, a James Merrill poem that, that they were filming. And uh, uh, Keith David was in it. Uh, I mean, it was a great cast. I was very fortunate to be in it, but I was, so we were out, in fact, the three of us were out to dinner one night and, and I s- said, finally, I got up the nerve to say to Bill, you know, I just want to let you know uh, that I really wanted to 
work with you and I, I auditioned for you. I remember he was in, he, I auditioned for him. He was in the room with it. And um, I was so heartbroken when I didn't get in, you know, and I, I, I just wanted to let you know how, how badly that I wanted that to happen. And he reached across the table and put his hand on my arm and he said, you didn't need us. Wow. I think I've told you that story, haven't I? Yeah, but they haven't heard it. But it, that's well, a really powerful story. It's really powerful because, first of all, he was a brilliant man. And, and he wrote the greatest book on directing. If anybody's listening who, who, who has a, an idea that they might want to direct for the stage, or it doesn't matter for what medium. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called A Sense of Direction. William Ball. He just knew that that was going to take the all that 15 years or whatever it was uh, of off, you know, and, I, and it just left. I mean, like that. It just left. It really? Yeah. Because I it, that, that that never occurred to me. And and you know, regardless of how he the truth of it, or he knew that it was the, it was just, it was the right thing to say. Because you know. I didn't they, they, know that once he was doing ACT that he was performing and leaving the school to go do. Well, things. he left the school at a certain oh. point. I think they, I forget how it worked out, but I think they forced him out. He had some issues and um, it's quite common that that happens with people who found, you know, who are founders of something that board comes in and, you know, eventually. Um, but yeah, he went off and tried, you know, had a career of his own freelance then. And that's when I met him. What a great whole story. That was like, a, I think a year before he uh, committed suicide, actually. Well, it's lovely that you got to have that closure on that experience. I know, that was- Really generous. That was the circle, right? So, okay, so James, tell us how you went from being a theatrical performer and, and a successful one, you were working all the time. How did that segue to you to you being a stripper on film? How did that happen, James? <laughs> <laughs> I um. Well, you know, I came to I came to L.A. and uh, a friend of mine, actually an actor friend from uh, from Alaska Rep, introduced me to an old friend of his from Atlanta, mm -hmm. who was an agent at Writers and Artists, uh, Joan Scott's agency back then, and and uh, I met her and socially and and. Uh, you know, she was a beautiful, beautiful person. She was my agent for 17 years, but but she she took me to writers and artists, and, and but hired me as a driver uh, to deliver scripts to, to clients. Yeah, so, because I needed a job, you know, and and she thought that would be Wait, the way how did to. You come here from? Were you just? Were you were? Did you not have a home base when you were acting? Were you just kind of going where the work was? Regional theater. But yeah, when you were at that stage of your life that you would. No, this is when I moved to LA. I was, I was, I oh, moved you did? Okay, you moved yeah. to LA. Okay, I missed that. In okay. 81. Yeah. Okay. I lived in New York for a little while, but I, I tried it twice and I just couldn't do it. It was- What it was, was your too... intention, James? What, what was your intention when you came here to get into film and TV? Did you- Oh, oh yeah. That and was... I wanted to, I wanted to make my living as an actor. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't do it in New York, so. That was the next logical, you know, step for me was to come to, you know, I mean, there were a couple of cities I could have gone to if I wanted to work in theater solely. Right. But, but uh, as it turns out, I made my living in the, in the theater in L.A. for the first couple of years I was here. I mean, I worked at the Taper. I worked at the at, uh, for L.A. Stage Company, which was a uh, cloud nine I did for a long run. Um, and were you did you study film and TV or did was that something I, I found a teacher, uh, Harry Master George, when I first got here, introduced to me by the woman who, who said, you're abusing your gift. Um, she was a very helpful person. Wasn't well, she? actually, you know, it was Annie Hearn. Mm -hmm. I think. Do you know Annie? I don't. She's a really talented actor, director. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I've thanked her for that over the years several times, so I'm doing it again now. Um, she introduced me to Harry and I've been, I've been with him for since then, so 40 years. I and, love the fact that you still study. That is so yeah. humble and wonderful. Well, and I'm with, with Risa Bremen Garcia now and she's, 
it, it's interesting because I don't really call her an acting teacher as much as I call her a facilitator and a and a an inspirer. Wow. You know, she knows how to get to the truth, but she she doesn't teach acting. If that makes sense, she can challenge you to as a, as an artist, just as a writer, or what you know, cr cross uh, discipline sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I credit her with that, that ability for sure, because she's, she's an amazing artist. So tell us about getting that first gig, that stripper gig. That oh, you, got. you know, you, when I didn't have my, uh, oh, so as anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm delivering scripts for the agents. And yeah, I mean, I took, I took scripts to, to Peter Scolari when he was doing uh, that, uh, the series with Tom Hanks. So I got to go to all the, I got to learn the city. And it was this, this back, back in the days, remember the Thomas guide days oh, where you've got this, you got this book in your, in, in your left hand. And if, if you've got a sh gear shift, you know, and you're reading this book while you're driving, I mean, I'm surprised that more people didn't die. <laughs> Because speak about texting when you're driving. I mean, this was so much more dangerous. It was like this thick for anybody who doesn't know. Yeah. So I learned the city anyway. But um, finally, one day they they said uh, uh, that Joan Scott, the head of the agency, said, "You're you're. A, I heard you're an actor." And I said, "Yeah, yeah, I am. I came here to to do that." She said, "Well, why don't you do a scene for us? And uh, you know, we'll see if uh, we want to represent you." I said, "Okay." So I brought in a scene and. Uh, <laughs> it was before I got sober. Yeah. So uh, we're doing a scene from a James. Oh, I forget the name of the play. But anyway, they're drinking bourbon in the in the in the scene. It's a one act play. And I brought in Jack Daniels, and I'm drinking, you know, in the scene. I mean, that's how. So, anyway, they decided. How did that to, to, go? <laughs> It, it went really well. They they signed me as a client, but they then they fired me as a as a delivery driver because I I couldn't be I couldn't do two things both things. So they started sending me out, and uh, I got really close to a bunch of stuff. I read for some great stuff, and then uh, read for this TV show with uh, um, Desi Arnaz Jr. called Aww. Auto Man about a computer cursor that comes to life and is a superhero. And so I get this guest star gig and I'm, and I'm not in union. So they hire me and I get my SAG card through this, but I get it uh, on the day my mother dies. I'm in Colorado. I auditioned for it before she gets sick. Mm -hmm. She had a, the aneurysm. I go to Colorado, she passes. I get a call. They want you to come back and do this job. And I, and I just said, well, I, I can't, I can't do that. I, I, my mother just died, I can, you know. Okay, no, that, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll tell them you pass. And I hung up and my sister said, what, 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 what did I just hear? My older sister. Yeah. Jane, what, what did you just say? Did you get it? What? And I said, yeah, I can't. And she said, what? No, you, pro you, she probably made this happen. Wow. From heaven. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, and there's nothing you can do here. Go do the thing. And I said, yeah, but I'm a wreck. I mean, look, my face is breaking out. <laughs> I mean, I was a total wreck. And I was... I was um, I was a year sober, wow. and uh, so okay. I flew back and I did the thing, and I was a complete wreck. But I had to do this scene. I was a, I was I was a Gary the Cat burglar at a strip joint in in Hollywood. That was my, you know, like <laughs> Tessie Tura from or from uh, Gypsy or you know, that was my deal. You gotta so have I'd a come gimmick. Up, you had to have a gimmick. You gotta have a gimmick. That's right. So, you know, I had put on the face thing and then I took everything off, but I didn't, they didn't do that then, of course, because it was prime time, right. but I had to jump out of a, off a stage into this crowd of women and there was no music playing and they couldn't clap because back in those days, the sound, you couldn't do sound because they couldn't match the so they were, you know, doing this and laughing, pretending. And I, I leapt off the thing and I was doing this, you know, grinds and <laughs> to, to no sound, to no music. Oh, my God. And, and um, I just improvised my, my choreography. No, no choreographer. <laughs> so, and I, but I just remember thinking, you know, I don't know if I can, 
I don't know if I can do this. This is, I, I don't know, mourning my mother at the same time. So I, I almost quit the business. It's it weird. Good thing you didn't. I'm glad I didn't, yeah. So was there more theater in there? Was it straight film and TV? What, what happened after that? Um, well, one more thing about that job. I, I was doing uh, uh, Emily Mann's still life uh, in Salt Lake City. After I shot that, I went to Salt Lake City. This was the one I went to Edinburgh with. Um, and they called me and said, we need you to come back to LA to do ADR. I said, I'm opening a play this week. I can't come back. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, and this was before they could do it over the phone. I think they were still analog. I mean, they couldn't do that. You know, right. they couldn't do that. It was just like a year behind that. Mm -hmm. So, okay, no, no, it's okay. We'll figure it out. We'll use production sound or something. Okay, fine. So I, I tuned in. It was Monday night on my night off. And I, all my friends in Salt Lake from the theater are there and we're going to watch my first TV gig. And, and uh, my, there's this one scene where the bad guys show up and I'm going into my apartment and it's a long hallway and these gangsters show up and they, they say, uh, are you, uh, is your name Gary? And I go, yeah, yeah, I'm Gary. Well, uh, we want you to come with us. And I go out of my mouth comes. Yeah, sure. Whatever you say. It's like somebody else's voice. They didn't even try to match my voice. So that, and, I, and I'm watching this. Well, just, they just, for that one line, yeah. Then it goes back to my regular voice. And I just went, wow, this is, on top of the stripping thing and the no music and, the, and how embarrassed I was. And my, I, I can't, I don't think I can do TV. I, I, if this is what it's going to be like. Anyway. But, but you did, but. I still yeah. stuck with it by God. You stuck with it. And how did, I would imagine that 24 was a game changer for you. I mean, I had, yeah. I'm sure seen you before that, but wasn't aware that it was, you know, your name wasn't, your name became part of my consciousness as well as your personage, personage with 24. How did, how did aside that, from the stripping and the, yeah. Aside yeah. from the stripping, how did yeah. that impact your life? Uh, because that had to, that had to change your life. Well, well you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, um, th that's what we, if we want to make a living as an actor, mm -hmm. that's what we hope for is a high profile. Um, the, you know, that's what the business demands that we get or we're, we're you know, because work begets work. I mean, you can do these things that nobody ever sees. Right. For, and people have done it and had careers doing that. But, but, you know, the thing that you're hoping for, everyone who does this is hoping for that thing where somebody will notice you. I mean, we do this to be noticed. Let's that, let's be that, real. Of course. And did you know, okay, I imagine you had to audition for the part at that stage of your career. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So when you read the script- I still, I still do. I mean, I still audition for parts. Yeah, that's, that's, in the, that's another it's, great it's, story. It's another thing. That's another hour. Yeah. Uh, um, so you get yeah. the part. Do you know, do you have any idea what you are no. walking into? No. Does anybody? That's hard to say. I mean, you know, if you ask them, they'd probably say, yeah, we knew. But I don't think they did because uh, it happened very quickly and they had to replace, they had, they, they lost uh, somebody and they had to replace them and they were trying some me out. I mean, you know, I just read a page and a half of dialogue and uh, through a process of, you know, he can't do it. Yes, he can. We want him, uh, but but the network, you know, I mean, it was it was kind of a big deal until finally uh, they they said, listen, if he wants this bad enough and we want him, let's just forget it. Let's just do it. Let's just make him look different from because I was doing a Fox show at the time. Uh, as a recurring, I wasn't even a regular, I was just a recurring guest star. And uh, that that's what the dilemma was. So they made me look different. That's why I came in with black hair. And and uh, first they put a goatee on me, a, a mustache, and, a, uh, and it was just awful. And I couldn't do that every day. But they didn't, nobody knew how long I was, I was hired episode to episode. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. It wasn't until the end of the the start of the next season that they decided to make me a regular. 
Isn't and that? I was very grateful. I was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful to them for that because, uh, uh, you know, it helped me pay off about t- 20 years of debt from being an unemployed, uh, you know, theater actor. <laughs> that was the biggest deal. And so, so there's been a lot of TV since then. There's been a lot of theater. You've written plays. You've, you're a singer songwriter. You've written a one man show and, and put it up. You, you did a, uh, the, the poster behind you showing up. Yep. Isn't, isn't that your, your documentary? That's it. Okay. So tell us a little, tell everybody a little bit about showing up. Um, showing up was uh, is uh, a documentary that my, that my wife and I Riyadh uh, uh, produced and directed, uh, in which we discuss with the help of like sixty brilliant actors what the audition is and what it does to us, rather than how to do it. We just we set out not to make a how to film. We wanted to make a film that that explores the, the idea of what you have to go through when you put out, when you put yourself on the line to get what you want in life. And what we discovered was uh, that you, you don't have to be an actor to relate to that process. I mean, everybody auditions uh, as, as uh, Janine Garofalo, Garofalo says in the thing, everybody auditions. Doesn't matter what you do for a living. And, you know, I mean, to, to bring it to this moment, you know, I, I met you. Mm-hmm. I came to your beautiful living room. You had, you know, you had never met me. Mm-hmm. I did my music for you with these two other guys, with, with Ed and... and uh, Bob Cowsell. You know, Bob, yeah, I mean, it's, it, and to be sitting there with him too, and Ed too, because I knew Ed. I'd worked on a, a thing with Ed, whom I love. I know you do too, mm-hmm. and and um, that was kind of an audition too. I mean, we do, we audition for, for for each other in ways that we don't even recognize we're doing it. You know, when even we're doing going it. on a date is an audition. Um, yeah, yeah, everything. Meeting is- meeting someone in the grocery store line that that you know, I don't know. It's it's a it's an offering and an, either an acceptance or a pass. Um, but not, not, not even necessarily a pass because when we first started talking about this and the people we talked to were the ones who showed us what our movie was going to be. I mean, we met B.D. Wong and, and, and uh, Stephen Spinella. And, and, uh, I told you last time I went to college with Stephen and Oh, that's right. Stephen might have gone to ACT. A few of people that I went to college with. Okay, I think maybe so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and I and I I think I had worked with him already. Um, or, or no, wait, no. I'm not sure because I'm not sure where that fell in the in the shooting of of uh, 24. But but we we did go to New York for the first time while we were shooting 24. Um, they showed us by uh, uh, Ewell Vasquez. I mean, these people just came in, Kristen Chenoweth. They just came in and, and opened up their hearts and said, okay, this is how this thing affects me. What did you, is there any, can you, by the way, Mark Gorham just said that he bought a copy today. Oh, he did. Yes, it went out. Uh, yeah. We all mailed it. Excellent. Um, thank you, Mark. Is there a, thank you, Mark. Is there is there one takeaway you can share with us that we might not think of in terms of how this impacts us? Is anybody's story, does anybody's story stand well, out as something? So, so many, but, but uh, t- two in particular, I mean, Jack O'Brien, my friend, the, the director, Jack O'Brien, he's the only re- uh, director who's not a teacher or a, I mean, if we talked to Harry, of course, uh, uh, but we talked to Jack and, and, uh, but it was, I think it was, uh, Lila Robbins who said, you know, when, when, uh, oh, so many things, so many things. And I love this movie so much. I, and the, the great thing about it is I, there's nothing like this out there. There isn't, a, a, and you can't say that about anything that you've done. I mean, to be able to say that regardless of its flaws or however, you know, whatever, 
What what motivated you guys, James, to make the well, film? We wanted we, we wanted to let people know, uh, actors know that they weren't alone mm -hmm. in how they felt about this thing that we have to do. And then it became something else. It became a bigger thing. Uh, the audition became an allegory for showing up for your life. Wow. And how much you put out there is, it, it, you know, what you get back is commensurate with how much you get, you know, give. Mm -hmm. you, if you go in being, you know, but the, Lila said, you know, some, we, we get hung up on this idea that they want to see the, the brand new shiny penny, she called it, the, the, the perfect actor, the, you know, but no, they want to see the human being. They want to see the real you, the, the, you know, kind of scuffed up, damaged. They want to see those parts. Those are the things that, that, that are going to make them go, oh, wow, this is, this is somebody really real here. Mm -hmm. And aside from the logical stuff, like they want to see what they wrote. They want to see, you know, they don't want to see acting. They want to see, uh... but, but the real, the real thing is, when, when Steven Spinella starts talking about just being an actor and mm -hmm. being walking into that room and, and, and how hard it is to, to actually just strip everything away and just be human mm -hmm. um, and make mistakes and fall on your face. And, and, you know, I mean, his moment in the movie is one of my favorite moments and, and, and Chris Messina too. I mean, where, where they just reveal themselves and what it means to, what it means to us to, to 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 be actors and to be to put ourselves out there I mean and it and it but it, not just actors I mean whatever it is that we create whatever we make whatever we want to give and share um, an idea a thought a part of ourselves that nobody's ever seen before I mean those are that's what makes us when we're moved, when we're watching something, it's because the actor did that, or the, the writer uh, dug a little deeper when they wrote it, or they, you know, the, the, the singer-songwriter got personal. I mean, remember, remember that thing that Chris Christopherson said to, to Joni Mitchell? Uh, uh, and, and, you know, please, Chris is one of my favorite songwriters, but he said to her, you can't, you can't, sing, you can't do that about her songs. What? It's that's too personal, and and um, she, I'm sure her reaction. That's all I remember the story because, but what she was doing was revolutionary. Right. It still is, mm -hmm. but when people do that, when people reveal them, themselves through their art, through their whatever they give, through what you do. I mean, when you you look at what you look at what you're doing, you're getting people to reveal themselves. There's an art to that. That's a gift. And you're really, no, really you good at it. Would you call my mother, please? <laughs> <laughs> Talk her in there. Hello, listen. Honey, um, her name is Honey. Um, oh. So this is a perfect segue. Uh, okay, is, can the, is, it, is the movie streaming? Is there a way for people to... Yeah, no, it's not streaming right now. We're okay. we're in between we're in between streamers. In between, well, that's what happens with everything. All all yeah. the best shows are get in between the streaming. So, so we're there now. You, you can go to to uh, showingupmovie.com. So you'll you'll send me the link after the show, and I'll put it in the liner notes so people can okay. just click it and they don't have to type. Anything. Oh, great! That'll be great. Showingupmovie.com. Yeah, when when Samantha was auditioning for. It was perfect timing when she was auditioning for college. Uh, so, or maybe it was a little, she was auditioning for something. Um, so this is a perfect segue into you telling us about revealing yourself, what your one man show, what motivated that? What uh, you said, it's not about your spiritual awakening. Tell us something about, tell us. Well, what uh, I, you know, I, I, uh, I couldn't tell Seamus a story because he's going to tell that he's a, he's a wonderful writer. And he, had, and he has written, in fact, I incorporate his poetry into the thing. Um, it's, a, it's a recurring uh, theme. Um, I wanted to tell the story of how it changed me. Um, so it wasn't, more, it wasn't so much about 
my son went through this and this was terrible and uh you know blah 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 it was more like i needed to go through this uh, this changed me and the and the the change um these things that we think are destroying us are are opportunities for growth and healing and and revelation and and uh um, enlightenment and then we'll like all other forms of enlightenment you know um move in and out of it you know and uh, like my friend ganga said in a letter today and we've talked about this a lot the state of non-knowing is as a valuable valuable uh teaching i place. hate not knowing I yeah i know it's so I know. you know i was i was uh this is a this is an interesting uh segue into this but it's not really it's the same subject but i somebody on twitter today if somebody that i've grown fond of uh said something about i don't know uh cannot cannot knowing what my path is right now is that okay i mean i feel like i'm and and you know that's sometimes that's the that's our path is just n not knowing and and uh we can learn as much from that as knowing what we're doing or knowing what we're pursuing or um because what like krishnamurti says if we can really honestly say i don't know mm -hmm. imagine what we can learn you know yeah that's pretty powerful yeah so so what what state are, are i assume you're going to be doing it more because you kind of did it and then COVID kind of hit yeah you know uh this is kind of a i was i was uh you know how when, we, when we're you know our sponsors say you know sure write that letter but make sure the waste basket's right there so you know so you have to really be careful with the emails but um i was oh yeah uh, i was uh, accepted to a solo playwrights festival uh which shall remain nameless but it takes place in colorado and you know we had a couple of great conversations and i was going to go in august august of last year and of course everything shut down and right so um i wrote them in february i guess i'm i'm just i'm just saying this because i'm venting a little bit so bear with me okay because i didn't write them and i didn't i didn't respond to this i did the good thing and i didn't tell them how i really feel because it doesn't matter but so i wrote them finally in february march and i said uh you know i'm i i just wondered what's happening for this year if you're going to be back up and i'm ready to go just want to let you know i'm excited about this. i'm still excited about this they wrote back and said well you know we're it, it's it's fungible at best um and, and i still haven't I didn't even look up the word because I no, read the I, rest I'm of thinking what is fungible. Well, I mean, I, I can guess. Uh... Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're looking at a bunch of scripts. We're looking at some things that we got sent. Uh, we're just not sure what we're going to do yet. And so I just went, Oh, okay. Uh, so I didn't hear, I didn't hear. Uh, finally, I got a note from Broadway world, you know, at the, uh, and they announced their season and my play is not in it so i went but but at the end of the letter he said you know i promise we'll let you know one way or another and we'll let you know what we're going to do i said okay so i didn't hear so then the the season is announced but i but then i go you know i've been i've been doing this now for 45 years and i just look at that and i go man that's the thing that kind of cowardice mm -hmm. is the thing that I think is the worst. It's not the reject. I, I could care less. Mm -hmm. Couldn't. I couldn't care less. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not I go. I it's, think it is. I could care less. I couldn't. No, I, could. I couldn't care any less than I do. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Um, I think it's that it's it's just that 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 people that just don't have the the courage to to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know? Mm. I mean, I love it. I've had auditions and people have said, you know, oh, well, uh, oh my God, his name just went out of my head. He directed Falling Down, my first m movie, uh, uh, um, just passed away. Um, anyway, God, I wish I could remember his name. Are you looking it up for me? I am. Joel Schumacher. Uh, there you go. Um, I auditioned for him. Marion Doherty called me in to read for Falling Down, and he said, I, I read for The Forest. Uh, the Forest. Uh, no, don't come Fred up with another one. I have to look up. Frederick, Frederick Forest part. Oh, wow. I was not right for the part. So, but I, but I blew his mind with my audition. I could tell. I mean, I was humping the chair, and I, you know, it was a terror. <laughs> so, and he was just sitting there in his chair at the end of it. He was going, Oh my God. And he said, I, I, you're not right for this part, but I'm going to put you in this movie somewhere. I promise you that. And he did. Wow. And, but he had, he, and, and I just thought, okay, this is how it's done. Mm -hmm. Just tell it like it is. Just say, you know, yeah, you know what? You're not right for this, but man, what an audition. Thank you. I'm going to keep you in mind for something down the road whatever or or but you know we just never but don't say i promise i'll you know i promise i'll contact you and then well, james how and, are you with that kind of stuff when you i hate that stuff i mean but when you have to be the deliverer of the news that somebody oh, oh yeah no i'll call I, I i've i've directed like six plays in my this life is what I call I'm people. Saying. so okay so you call people and you give them the news. here here's the thing I worked at Burt Reynolds Dinner Theater when I was in 1985. I was a couple of years sober. I'd done my apprenticeship. I, I was working with Charles Nelson Riley. It was a beautiful oh. thing. He he had a an apprenticeship program at this at his theater. It's an, an amazing place. Charles Nelson Riley was the head of, of the apprenticeship program. Wow. It, wonderful, wonderful um, apprentices. In fact, one of them was in Twin Peaks. I wish I could remember his name, I'm, but I'm sorry. I must have had <laughs> blood sugar issues. <laughs> Um, he took me aside one day, this kid, uh, played the detective on twin, on the reboot of Twin Peaks, just passed away too. Lovely man. He took me aside though. And he said, you know what, um, what's, what's your deal? What's the deal with you? Cause you're, um, why are you so nice to us? You're, and I said, well, he said, yeah, no, we're apprentices, you know, and nobody's nice to us. You're nice to us what's what's your deal wow. and he was he was like that he was you know a southern kid he was really and I, oh i said oh okay well i was an apprentice man i know how it feels to be treated like shit and i know that you guys deserve respect because you're working hard and you you know you're and, and also who knows where you're going to be 10 years from now if i did something to piss you off i mean that's just that just makes sense why would i do that i might need you i might you might be hiring me 10 years from now Plus, you know, listen, I, I've been where you are, man. I know what it feels like. So, yeah, that's why. And that's what it is. It's just, it's just knowing. Um, I don't even know if it's empathy. I think it's just awareness of people deserve respect. Mm -hmm. You know? I like that. So, James, yes. it, here we are not really at the end of COVID, we're still kind of dealing with stuff. What's your, what's your life now? What's Seamus and Riyadh? How are you as a family dealing differently or not? Um, what, what have you allowed yourself to do? And career wise, what this I'm having so I hate being blue microphones, by the way, yay, my Yeti, I'm using my Yeti X. And I hope it's sounding much better today. Sounds um, great. Thank you, Kevin Walt, for uh, this fabulous microphone. Um, so moving forward, what would you most like to see happen next? Are you ready? Like you got on a plane and you traveled in February, you went and you went to New York. So you are living life again. I'm living the dream. You're living the dream. So what is the dream now? What, what, what would be your dream now? What do you hope happens next? Oh, I would love to, to, to do the play. I mean, you know, I had a, I had a uh, one night 
audience of a script in hand reading of, of this one man play that I wrote. Is, it, is and, this uh, the night that Anson and that they went to the thing locally in Ojai? Was that something else? Yeah, no, I don't think he was there for that. Mm. But but no, it was the same theater. Yeah, and it was just a we do a you know one one uh, one performance. I would love to do that. That's the dream, and so I'm working on on memorizing it uh, until we get a gig somewhere, until we get a, a, a commitment, so that we can just step in and have you know two three weeks of rehearsal and put it up. Uh, Robert Egan and I, he's my partner on it, our director, director dramaturg. I've known Bob for forty years. And are you back to, are you auditioning? Are you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Every now and again, yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I would love uh, that to continue. That's one great thing I think that's happened about uh, from this. What's um, that? Auditioning from home, primarily. I mean, I, I do it here because I live in Ojai. And right. they, they, they let me do that quite often. And, 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 you know, sometimes it's valuable to go into the room and, mm -hmm. and meet people. But for the most part, I, I mean, I'm I'm quite comfortable here online. You know, we're having a great connection here, right? It, we don't doesn't, need to, it doesn't feel like we're not in the same room, does no, it? it we, no, because we're, you know, we're doing that, that Pete Townsend thing we were talking about. <laughs> Listening and, you know, caring, right? So you, I know you have a few projects. One is pending, one, one was just, you have a couple things that are going to come out. You have something that just is going into production. You have a few things on your IMDb that are current. Oh yeah, though I, you know, those things are. Uh, you know, you know, you never, you never really can know until you, till you, sign the contract, sort of things. Yeah. But I've said, I've said yes. I'll, I'll be happy to. I'd love to do that with you if that happens. And so they you have a couple of things in post production, though. I think that are going to come out that you've already d shot. No. Oh, really? Gee, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I have to look at that. Couple things on your IMDb. Let's see oh. there. <laughs> I don't know. That's 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 news to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, but it's great. I mean, I you know, I'd love to hear it. So are you guys back to how, what is your life like uh, as a family? Are you back to going out into the world? Are you still eating at home? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, we're we, we go, we're going out now. Uh, we've been eating out more lately because the construction we've uh, been under. But yeah, we no, you know, we're very um, tight, the three of us. Yeah. Um, probably not fair to say that. Uh, well, you know, we have a lot of friends with kids, and and they don't have the same bond hmm. you know i think you when you're back to back in the foxhole with with somebody you know you you uh you have a different relationship with them mm -hmm. and uh so we went through that you know what shame is up to now that he graduated he is uh, actually technically graduated but he's still doing one more class this summer mm -hmm. um and he wants, you know, he's, he wants to get a job. He, he got a job right away. In fact, the day after he graduated as a translator for a, a lawyer friend of ours who, who uh, does pro bono work for immigration cases. So Seamus was able to translate for this woman from Colombia, I think she was. How wonderful. Yeah, so he's, he, you know, he wants to, and I keep saying to him, man, you don't have to, what are you doing? You don't have to work. If you don't want to, take a year off. What do you, you know, you just... You did 17 years of school. Wow, you aren't you the dream parent that every kid wants to have? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, he worked really hard uh, in school and he, and he, you know, he made the dean's list a couple of times. And he, so he, he did he did really well um, went, and went through hell. Um, so. I mean, I'm, I don't know if, if I'm spoiling him or not. I, uh, he's, he's got a pretty good sense of uh, um, where he wants to go, I think, right now, as, as much as you can have at 22. I don't know. Well, James, aside from being what sounds like a wonderful parent, uh, 
you are what I know to be a wonderful person. I am so thrilled that you're in my life and that we're friends and oh me too and thank Thanks. you so much for coming and talk I, I mean there's this love affair everybody is just like everybody on the thread is just madly in love with you and i will do everything i can to make sure that as many people as possible see this because facebook fucks with it but we'll get it out there anyway yeah but um but <laughs> i'm so glad we were able to do this again i love Hi. sitting with you and talking I, I do as well. And I look forward to uh, coming back to oh hi next week. I'm going to, I'm going to text you and, and. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm there. I'm there. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. I love you, Vicki. I love you too, James. Take Thank care. You. Have a wonderful rest Thank of your day. Bye. You too. Bye.